Welcome to Queener Lax, Lax and Poetic. I'm your host, Bryce Queener. We're going to talk all things Lax on this show with some of the greatest personalities in the sport. Be sure to check out our sponsor, QueenerLax.com, for swag, camps, and clinics. Got questions? Want to hear something? Get in our DMs, at QueenerLax. Hey, thanks for listening. And remember, ABC, always be cradling. All right, fans, today we're welcoming our guest, Coach Hobart, here. We're, we're blessed to be joined by the living legend, as the Finger Lakes Times has, has dubbed him, uh, the current head coach of the Penny and Mustangs. He has countless Finger Lakes and Section 5 championships to his name, state championship winner. He's coached countless All-Americans, tons of guys who are now in the pro leagues. He has also coached in the pro, the MLL and the NLL, and for Team USA Indoor um, one of my favorite offensive coaches I've ever had or coaches in general, a mentor to me and a leader to all the kids in Penn Yan. Uh, Coach Hobart, really excited to have you join us. Yeah, I, I looking forward to chatting. It's been a while since you and I have had a conversation and I really liked, uh, really liked what you've done on the first few of these podcasts. So excited to be here. Thanks coach. Um, I guess I'll just start right away. Bradley, if you've listened to any of the other podcasts, Bradley, has, has continued Bradley Voigt, now also known as Bubba Voigt, wearing the number eight in Penyan. It really started with you um, when you graduated, I think in 88, am I right? 87. 88, 87. Uh, you graduated as the all-time leading goal scorer, um, passed that number on to me. I ended up being the all-time point scorer. Then Bradley took it over. So the succession of eight has started with you. Um, you were a big time force in the eighties. My dad loves telling the stories about you and G you playing against Geneva, um, over there under the lights, scoring a hat trick, maybe jumping on some guys in a dog pile or after a play or something. But I've asked Bradley this before I'll ask you was, is, is your more favorite game Geneva or Canandaigua? Uh, as a, as a player, it was Canandaigua. As a player. What As a player, it was Canandaigua. That, that's a tough one. I, I mean, uh, the, the, the old field in Geneva, before they redid their stadium, uh, was a grass field, and the fence was about three feet behind the goal. Uh, and there used to be a cast of characters that would come over there and heckle me. Um, you know, so I, I used to get pretty cranked up going to, uh, going to Geneva as well to try and perform well. Talk about um, – you, you bring up cast of characters. We have a bunch from the end. Um, and, and maybe I know the pictures with you, I, I don't really remember I was there, but you, you got the mullet, you got the two-tone shade. Sometimes you get, you got, you got, I said, I wasn't going to say swagger on this podcast. You had the 80s swagger and I, and I think you had the van to match it all. Um, and, and your big guitar guy, we'll talk about that later, but are you the, for me, it starts with you. So I'm just going to call you the OG Penny and lacrosse player and where we kind of all derive our or maybe cockiness and swagger from, but um, did you have people before you teach you that, or does it? Did you just come up with how to how to really represent Penny and Lacrosse? No, not not really. I mean, um, prior to my junior year, Penny and Lacrosse had never had a winning season. Um, you know, so and, and the group of guys that I grew up with was was a bit of a cast of characters: uh, Johnny McKinnon and Chris Holly and Scotty Hansen, um, and we were the first group that really, with your dad, had our sticks in our hands more than just lacrosse season. Um, and we wanted to prove that we could be good. You know, the only one really prior to that had been, uh, you know, Donnie Bergeron, the Birdman, uh, who was a year older than us. Uh, so there really wasn't a whole lot of swagger associated with, with Pena and lacrosse. And we, you know, we were pretty good and we wanted to prove we were pretty good. Yeah, Bradley, Bradley came on a show and said it started with me and Brad. And I'm like, whoa, no, it started way before us. We, we watched these guys play, and um, that's pretty awesome. So you, I mentioned the success you had in high school being, being one of the top scorers we've ever had or being the top goal scorer we've ever had. Um, but you chose to go play football in college and instead. Were, were you torn on that decision? What led you to go play football? A little bit. I, uh, I, I really enjoyed playing football uh, and was pretty good at it. Uh, and I, I kind of had made that decision before my senior year of lacrosse. Um, and then I went out as a senior and, and scored a whole bunch of goals uh, and recruiting, recruited to play lacrosse. Um, but I kind of had already had it in my head that I was going to play football. So I, I stuck with that. You know, I, I, at one point I was going to go play for a year and then go play lacrosse. Um, but then when I got there, 
Um, you know, I met a great group of guys. Uh, I was fortunate enough to start a few games as a freshman um, playing college football. So I, I, I stayed there. Uh, and, and you were my, um, I played football for you and JV, you were my offensive coordinator. Then luckily my senior year, we got to have you as our, our defensive coordinator, which was a blast. Um, I, I, I know that you and Harry, my dad, bring a lot of football lessons to the, to the lacrosse field. W what's the biggest thing you, you still think you take away from football that you apply to lacrosse? Uh, I, I think the biggest thing I bring from football and, and having a football background is uh, in, in football, you only get to play once a week. So you practice a lot and it's not fun. Um, but if you're not willing to put the work in when it's not fun, you don't have the success. Um, and, and I try to bring that, that kind of work ethic mentality. Um, practice is, is not necessarily going to be fun all the time. You know, we're going to work on things um, that, that aren't necessarily fun, but in the end, they're going to make us successful. And I, I think that aspect of football um, and, and also the teamwork concept. In football, one guy screws up, everybody screws up. Um, so you have, you know, it really brings some accountability. And, and I try to bring some of that. Too. I mean, I, I can remember telling you, you know, you know, you got 10 other guys here that are relying on you, you know, and, and I think that's really important is that, is that accountability piece and, and the day to day, you got to go to practice and you got to grind. And, and I know um, for us, when we, when we played lacrosse for you, that was a big part of part of our day. It was our first and we loved it. And it's funny that you, you talk about practice and work and I think you've, you've done an outstanding job throughout your career of, of, of bringing energy to practice because people want to play for you and you do make it fun. Um, I'm going to ask you some stuff about that later, but um, I remember the first, uh, I think it kind of started my ninth grade year where we started really just working with you for like the first 20 minutes of practice. We used to start right away. We'd go right into agilities and three man and, and our set penny on practice plan, which was, which was difficult, but fun. Um, then we started doing like, uh, dodge to the end line and back, dodge to, and then some more shooting drills and things like that. Um, and, and even when I went to college, we stopped doing individual drills and we did a podcast that dropped um, today about cone drills. Um, I'm curious, what do you do now to, to drill with your guys? What, what's your go-to stuff now? Do you, do you break practice down the same way? Are they with you? Are they with you as soon as they get out there and doing offensive stuff? Uh, they're not with us immediately. Um, you know, nothing's changed. We start with agilities uh, for conditioning. Uh, and then every day, and, and I'm a big proponent of is we spend probably 15 to 20 minutes on a team stick work, um, you know, with that, with everybody doing, doing stick work. And sometimes it's, you know, we, we don't do line drills because nobody does a line drill in a game. Uh, so I try to make them as realistic as possible. Um, but it, it might be, clearing the ball off the end line where everybody touches it, getting it to the other end of the field for a shot. Um, but we're doing some type of team stick work drill every day. Uh, and then we split. Uh, the defenders go with your dad, um, and I take the offensive guys with me. And it's usually about a half an hour. Um, and there's usually some type of dodging component, uh, a stick work component. Um, and we, we shoot a lot. We, we, shoot, we shoot the ball a ton. Um, you know, I know with your dad, he'd bring out 20 balls for practice and he, you know, that, that was all he wanted to bring. Um, you know, I, I'm bringing out three or 400 yeah. every day, every day to practice. Um, and, and we spend a lot of time shooting, um, and, and working those individual techniques. You know, if, if there's something that we're seeing in film, um, you know, kids are struggling to get to the top side, you know, coming from behind, we'll take some extra time and, and drill those pieces. Um, if we want to know that we're going to want to wing dodge in the next few games, we'll spend a lot of time doing wing dodges, you know, so it's a little more specific and, and individual with some kids. Uh, I'm lucky to have another guy with me with the offense with Chris Reddington. Uh, so there's days where, you know, I'll take just the midfielders and he'll take the attackman and they'll work on specific things and, and the midfielders will work on specific things. How do you think you've changed? You, you've had, You've had great offensive players every, every other year. There's a guy in this city. I'm in Denver right now. Adam Trombley's down the road for me who went on to start Ohio state. I mean, every couple of years we have, or every year we have a star offensive player. And, and from those of you that don't know about Penny and it's a village of 5,000 people. So um, how do you think you've changed your philosophy and your approach though? Cause I had Bradley on 
last week, I, I told him, I'm like, your highlight video I'm watching from high school, you're shooting things that I would have got 50 up downs for not blaming you at all. I'm just, I, we all change and grow. And, and I think that's why probably you continue to have phenomenal offensive players. You're not, you don't, you're never stuck in one, one pattern. So no. how do you think you've changed your mindset on offense over the years? I, I, I think as I've gotten better as a coach, um, I do a, I, I think I do a pretty good job of recognizing what kids are good at and putting them in spots to succeed. Um, you know, and that, you know, we, we talked a little bit about developing offense and that's a huge piece of that. Um, if we don't have a group of kids that are downhill midfield Dodgers, we're not going to run an offense that has downhill midfield Dodgers. No. Um, you know, and the, the creativity piece, we've had some kids, you know, Brad, Bradley's one, um, you know, and, and Justin Wall was another one uh, that they, I tell them they earn the freedom. You know, you shoot overhand until you earn, you earn your sidearm card, you know, um, and, and the more you let, you know, if you let a kid make a play like that in practice, you can almost, you know, see the confidence rise, you know, a, a kid makes a behind the back pass or a kid, you know, does an underhand shovel, um, you know, you can almost see their confidence gain. And I've gotten better through my experience being around the NLL and, and indoor guys. I'm more comfortable teaching those skills. True. When you played for me, you know, we, we were going to hammer the ball overhand, you know, and, and we weren't going to, we had some guys, you, you could throw it behind your back, um, but we were going to stick really to the fundamentals. Um, but since I think I've gotten better at teaching some of those things that the kids, you got to give them a chance. You got to be a little freer. Yeah. And they enjoy it. No, I love that. Uh, I noticed also, and I don't know if this is a quarantine thing or not, but I've noticed you're shooting now a lot with the box goalie. I know you got some guy you call Kool-Aid, I think is his name. Um, <laughs> well, I've, been trying, I've been trying to do that for my last three coaching stops, but the box pads are so expensive, but um, are you doing, were you doing that with, with the, with the varsity team too, or has that been a box separate kind of thing? Um, it, it's with my varsity guys doing some training. Um, you know, I was able to, through some of the quarantine, do a lot of small group stuff. And I'm fortunate enough. I have, you know, one guy's 62 and the other one's about 30 that will come anytime I ask them and put the pads on. Uh, and, and it's just so much more realistic, especially with a box goal, you know, doing, doing shooting drills and throwing it into an open net. Um, you know, it, it just doesn't help. I actually, I, I listened to Darius Kilgore on a podcast with Jamie Monroe. Uh, and it was one of the best, it, it kind of really changed my philosophy. Um, you have to shoot on a goalie uh, because there has to be an element of deception. You have to see where you're shooting, where the openings are. Um, so I, I try to not shoot on an empty net as much as possible. So you guys really, if, if, when you're doing shooting drills now, no empty nets. No, I, uh, you know, we've been fortunate, even with our high school kids, um, we've had some goalies that see some shots in practice uh, on, a, on a six by six, um, but there's always a board or a target or part of the goal is blocked. Um, okay. I bought one of those big blow up things um, yeah. that we, you know, I put in front of the kids so they've got to shoot around it, um, you know, because just shooting at an empty net, it, it, it's not realistic and you might be able to, you can work on um, some motion and, and shooting discipline. Uh, but I think to score goals, you've got to shoot at, at something, preferably a goalie. Yeah. There's, there's no doubt that the, the box goalie can help change your shot and, and deception and things we, we talk and shooting. Um, you had some great shooters, but I think, um, and I know this from playing for you and, and playing for my dad and, and watching everybody comes out of Penyan the assist is celebrated in Penny and the, the, the idea that an assist is better than a goal is, is pounded in our, for lack of a better term, in, in a good way, it's pounded in our heads since we're little, how do you create passers? It's something I've been, I've been just trying to figure out more and more like, cause we do all these shooting drills whenever we get our offense now. And I'm like, how do we do more? I, I'm wondering if I do more like wave your stick drills and throw to targets. I, I'm trying to find new passing drills. I don't know if you guys got anything, but I know if I go watch Penny and play lacrosse and there's a two on one, they're going to make the right pass. They're, they're not going to, they're not just going to shoot it. I, I think a lot of that comes is we don't do any drills where you just shoot the ball. We will do some shooting on the run drills. Cause you have to, 
but most of our shooting drills, there's a feeder who's driving to X, stepping away, freeing his hands, passing the ball. And as you know, if we're wasting balls and he throws a bad pass, I'm not a real happy guy. Um, so a lot of our things that we do in shooting, um, you know, I, I love to dodge from the wing. Um, so we'll dodge the wing and bang it to that attackman backside, and he's got to feed off, off a quick stick there. So I think we're kind of ingraining, you know, some of those techniques that they're going to see in games. Um, they, they get to practice it. So that's a great point. Um, I was just kind of sitting here remember. Remember when you used to give out uh, manila envelopes with the plays in them that were on like, uh, yeah, before playbooks even existed and we had rifle and we had Hawk. You still run Hawk. I know you run. Do you still run Hawk? Um, kind of my philosophy as coaching offense is, is, is really molded by, by playing for you. Whereas we had all these plays, we had all these great one hitters, Hawks and end line play. Bradley talked about it. We had combo that we ran first play of the game, every game we had a rifle and we had a couple man up plays. But then after that, I mean, we were really taught. I think the best compliment I've ever got was a guy from Geneva a couple summers ago said to me, he's like, I don't even know what you guys are running. You just always shared the ball. People always scored. Um, there was always an, a, a, an idea of what we we're trying to do. What, what kind of offense are you running now? Are you still, are you still with that? run some quick hitters, then run some field plays. Like what, what do you think works best for you now? You know, off the end line, we're going to run a set play every single time. Everyone. You know, we're, we're going to run something uh, every single time because, you know, if we get 10 opportunities to run something off the end line, we're going to steal two, you know, we're going to, we're going to steal at least two goals every game um, because a kid's subbing off the fields from the other team that doesn't want to play defense. They're not getting matched up. Um, you know, so we try to really pick up the ball quick and, and attack with something set. Um, six on six, we still run a number of set plays, but it's more of we're running rotations. Um, we're looking for something. If it's there, we'll take it. But we're looking, you know, if, if the first look isn't there, we're swinging the ball to the backside and redodging. Um, so the, the set plays give us that initial structure. Um, but if it's there, great, but we're looking for something on the backside. You know, if we had, you know, we've had some kids like Bradley, you know, we're running some set looks to get him, you know, uh, a mumbo off the popping off the crease. Um, you know, we're getting into a one four and setting a pick for him to, to cut down the backside. You know, we're running some specific things like that for certain kids, you know, but I mean, formation wise, um, you know, not much has changed. We start with an open set, just like you did. Um, and, and we build out of that patience or circle, which one do you call it now? Patience, patience. Nice. Do you think of guns and roses every time you call out patience or is that? No, no, that's... <laughs> no but it, it drives, I, I think it drives the other team crazy a little bit because they think I'm stalling. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm just trying to get my kids in an open set. Um, you know, and that open you set came from get them a touch, right? Like you want to get everybody a touch still, right? Isn't that a goal? Mm -hmm. And with a small school, we don't have two, three midfields. No. So we get into patience and our attackmen do a lot of the ball carrying um, during that time because it allows our midfielders to rest. Um, you know, that was kind of why we started using that open set. Uh, and it's just kind of, you know, ev evolved where we can do a lot out of that. Uh, it's a great formation to run some two man game out of. Um, it's a great formation to quickly, you know, you can get into a one, four, one really quick. Um, so a team has to go from an adjacent slide, uh, and change their package in, in a matter of a couple passes, we can be in a one, four. I think my favorite, literally my favorite thing that happens in a lacrosse game. Okay. For those of you at home, patience is a big circle. We spread it way out. You know, it, it's, it's like a yellow call, but not really yellow. Like we're ready to play when a team freaks out when you're up like two and there's eight minutes left in the game and a team freaks out and chases you and you get to just start scoring easy goals. I, I still think that is my favorite time of, of a lacrosse game and and I, and I love patience um you mentioned two-man game are they letting you move more in high school like they are in pro i, I haven't watched high school no. lacrosse in a while no you still gotta no. be pretty set how are you teaching it differently i remember even when i played I, i'm pretty sure it was back still people were saying like don't don't bring two people to the ball why would you ever pick some x picks were happening now it's all two-man how are you evolving in your in your teaching of it of the two-man game uh, I, I've spent so much time with the indoor game uh, over the last 15 years um, that 
you know, I, I've been fortunate to be around a lot of Canadians and, and a lot of uh, First Nations players. And you just you just pick things up. Um, you know, we kind of we, we use our two man game to set up slips. You know, we'll pick we'll pick and then we'll slip, um, you know, and we do have some we, you know, we do hit on some nice two man goals. But a lot of that is we get uh, we do a lot of it on the wing and our Dodger gets over the top side. Um, you know, th- with the two man game, the Dodger gets over the top side and then it forces the defense to rotate. And, um, you know, through the box game also, we run a lot of two man stuff on the back side. Yeah. Uh, you know, so if we're if we're dodging on the left hand wing in a two man game, the two guys on the right hand wing are doing kind of an up down pick motion as well. Um, you know, so it takes away your slide. It takes away your second. Um, you know, we play a, a pretty challenging schedule with good teams and good coaches. Um, so the more that we can cause some confusion, change their slide, um, get them out of what they're comfortable with, the better off it is for us, I think. You mentioned good teams, good coaches. I'd be remiss if I didn't um, talk about where I get um, my affinity for like talking about this stuff and watching film. Uh, you and my dad, when you first, I mean, and I can't believe coach how young you were then. I thought you were like as old as you are now (laughs) then, but after every game, every single game, this is VHS days, you and my dad would go home and watch the game. And me and Brett would sit there while you guys rewound and like, like, I mean, watched every big play. You guys were like Chris Berman on sports center. Like you, you, and we'd never want you to leave because dad would be in such a good mood when you guys want a game and and, and celebrate. And so do you think coaches are now, I, I think you guys are way ahead of the time. I know other people were watching film, but you guys were watching a ton. Um, do you think everybody's caught up on that with huddle and things like that now that, that you got to even prepare more for teams? Uh, honestly, I probably watch less film. You do? <laughs> um, you, you know, you, you can uh, like anything else. Moderation is best. I agree with that. I can you know, yeah. And it's, I have, we have a pretty good system. Your, your dad and I, um, you know, this year will be year 30. Yeah. That I've been coaching uh, with the exception of the four years he was with the girls. So 26 years we've been together. Um, when we watch film, he, he more looks at individual players. And I look more schematically kind of, kind of big picture. So it works out really well. You know, he, he knows that their left-handed attackman wants to get up to 10 yards, wants the inside roll, you know, where I'm seeing, you know, they might be exchanging on the backside when that happens. Yeah, um, so we, we've become over the years, a really good fit in, in terms of that. Yeah, that's a great point. I, every season I will, I'll almost like throw my board in a hissy fit. Cause I'll be like, why are we watching so much film? We're not even changing anything we're doing. You know, we're just basically becoming fans of the other team. Um, it's nice if you do have a, a good relationship with that. Okay, I want to talk about back to offensive players. Um, and really, uh, I, I think in the women's game, the last seven years I've been coaching, there's such a big emphasis on relationships, team bonding, talking to each other. I've actually really enjoyed learning a lot more about that stuff. Um, but I, I, I really, a lot of times, just think back to you, I think in, in your counselor, in your, um, am I saying it right? You're a counselor. I'm, I'm the, currently the Dean of students. You're now the Dean of students. You used to be a counselor, correct? I did. Yeah. And, and you just, you've always had a, a really good way of working with little kids and, and talking to them and being there for them. How much do you think that's important for offensive players? Like you, you, you not just, you know, being the guy who's going to chew them out, but the guy who's going to help them through tough things. Uh, I, I think that's big with offensive players because in, in this game, if you are confident and you believe in yourself, you can be better than you really actually are. But if you, if you start to doubt yourself, you, you can crumble really quickly. Um, you know, so I, I try to find that kind of that fine line between I'm going to push you harder than you've ever been pushed, but when you do it right, I'm going to pat you on the back, you know, and, and I, I'm going to trust you and, you know, kind of you earn more. You know, and, and the kids see that I'm a big proponent of you, you earn things in practice, um, you know, but and I think a lot of it is the communication piece. Um, you know, we, we've got a lot of kids, you know, Penyan is a beautiful place, but you know, some of, some of our kids got, got some tough lives, you know, and, and they've got to be able to communicate with you and talk to 
to, and you've got to know your kids. And that, and that hasn't changed since you played. You see a kid in the locker room before practice that looks a little off, you know, you, you, you got to recognize that and have a little, you know, hey, bud, how you doing? Tough day, you know, um, because if you go out and grind him that day, he's going to crumble. Yeah. You know, so I, I think just knowing your guys and, and it builds that trust. You know, I, I knew with you guys, I, I pushed you guys like crazy, but you knew if you needed something, all you had to do was say, hey, coach, can I talk to you? You know, and, and we had that that, that bond. <laughs> That's kind of making me remember uh, curfew. Do you guys still have curfew the night before games? Ah, uh, We talk about it. I'm not calling 30 kids anymore. <laughs> I thought about today. I was on my hike. And you know, so we used to have Saturday morning games. Sometimes it's, it's, it's those damn cell phones. Yeah, well, well, you could was, be anywhere. I was figuring you just text him. So coach used to call our home phone. But the reason I bring it up is because we used to get excited. We're like, I hope because you didn't always call everyone. You got like a few, you know, you do the sample where you you ch- try to check if they're home or not. And it, we'd get pumped if you called the home phone just to say hi to you. Uh, it's kind of kind of just some nostalgia there. So I was wondering if you still still did that. But no, they, no, I mean, and, and part of it was. You're right. Kid, kids started to actually want to get called. Yeah. And you know, I'm spending three hours on the phone. Kids supposed to be home at 10 o'clock. I'm on the phone till midnight. I remember telling you one time, like I didn't get my call. Like I was waiting Friday night for my call from my coach. And that's, that's just kind of neat. That, that That's, that's something I remember that we, we actually enjoyed hearing from our coaches on a curfew. Um, so you mentioned, you mentioned my dad. Um, obviously he, he took over the Penny Am program when you were, when you were, you know, just coming up through the He was ranks. my JV coach for one year. Uh, and then I played varsity for a year for Jim Burnett. Uh, and then Coach Q took over when I was a junior. And then, so you had your first winning season ever, your, your junior year, which would have been 86. Yeah. And then we haven't had a losing season since. Uh, no, no, we had, a, we had a rough go a few years ago, but, you know, we still won sectionals and went 10 and 10. So it's not a losing season. Oh, we were 10 and 10. I thought it was like 10 and 9. No, we had, we, had, we had a tough go. You know? counts. It's tough, man. Sometimes it was, you mentioned earlier, you play those brutal schedules now and, um, and you guys are still rolling, but you guys have such a good relationship. I think the secret to your success is obviously the, the box rank combined with both of you. Um, how do you guys still make it work? How, how do you, you talk about the film, but it's been 25 years. I've, I've been on staffs that have a hard time making it through one season together. Um, I think we have just a ton of respect for each other. Uh, and, and it goes both ways. Um, you know, in, in 30 years, um, there's times in the locker room where we get at, we argue, you know, but I don't think one time in 30 years we've ever argued or spoke bad to each other on the field in front of kids. Um, and, and, and I see other staffs do that. Um, you know, we, we talk to each other with respect and we, and we honor each other's opinion. If we don't agree with it in the locker room, we'll say, Hey, we don't, you know, I, I think that's stupid, you know, but we don't do that in front of the kids. Um, and we listen to each other and we both know after so long, we know what each other's strengths are. You know, he's very business-like. I'm kind of a little off the wall at times. Um, so we just kind of, you know, play off each other a little bit, you know, yeah. Um, so I mentioned the box rank. I mean, this is a perfect example of playing off each other. So um, the setup, I think it was 92, the box happened. What year did you come back to Penny Ann? Nah, 92. That was my first year back. What was your, I was thinking this today, were you like, what do you mean we're going to build a box rank? Like, were you, what was your first thoughts? Do you remember? Do you, like, Because now I'm looking back and I'm like, how did these guys even pull this off? Uh, I was really excited about it. Um, I had, I had begun playing a little bit up in Rochester at Culver road, um, and a little bit heading to the Onondaga nation to play a little bit. Um, and I thought, Holy cow, this, this is going to be fantastic. Um, and a, a gentleman, Bruce Hansen ran, was the president of the lions club here in town. Um, and they have a big community service project they do every year. Um, and we kind of put together a proposal and, you know, in a matter of, a couple of weekends, these guys built us the chicken coop, you know, and we could, we had a place that was our own that we could play and you didn't need 25 guys, you know, you, you get, you know, four or five guys 
you know, you can play, you know, a, a little pickup game. Um, and the, the program we ran there was really, really helpful and still is. But I still think the biggest part is you go to our rink today. Um, I, I drove in there yesterday because I did some training with a couple of my older guys. And there's seven middle school kids shooting. There were. You know, um, it, it, it's a place that um, kids can go and you're not chasing the ball. It comes back to you if you miss um, that they can kind of go and take care of things. Yeah. So um, the setup, and I still think it's the best setup going, you know, you got a two hour block and for an hour, kids would do skills and drills with you. And then the next hour they go play a game. You had it harder, <laughs> no doubt. Cause my dad was refing the games in the box. You had to deal with kids like me who just didn't, we just want kids just want to play games. They yeah. don't want, they don't want, and you weren't making us, I mean, you were just having us pass and catch and do things we needed to do. Um, so thank you very much for doing that and having to deal with me for all those years where I threw baby fits. Um, but I just, I, I, was, I, 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 I talked to this guy in Denver the other day who was, who was telling me it's just so hard because his kids go to club practice and they learn a whole different set of lingo ways things are done. And, and do you think a big part of why you guys keep rolling is you get these kids so early and they hear the same message for so long? I, I, I think that's, that's a huge part of it is um, a kid's been hearing me say certain words in certain terms since they were six years old. Yeah. You know, um, and, and I think that's part of it. It certainly helps. Well, uh, one thing that I know you guys have instilled at that box rank and, and, and in your program forever is just how to compete and have kids care and give a crap. And I, I remember, um, I don't want to give Jason Darcy a shout out on the podcast, but I guess we are. Uh, no, I love Darcy. One of our, one of our greatest players ever, but I remember him telling a story and you guys being like, why do you care so much? And he'd been gone for like 10, 15 years. And he was like, cause you guys made us this way. Like you made us care so much about, about Penny and lacrosse, about sports, about, about winning um, in a good way. I, I just think it's important for people to have things to care about. How do you, how do you think you guys do that? I think we relate it to life. You got to compete. When, when you go in for a job interview, you're competing, you know, uh, everything in life is a, is a competition, you know? And I, the, one of the greatest quotes I heard is you, you've got to hate losing more than you love winning. Yeah. Um, you know, and we set we set up a lot of our practice where we compete um, and kids, kids are able to buy in one, one of the, I, about six or seven years ago, I started telling kids I implemented an, an off season running program. Um, and, and we've had a great, uh, great turnout for that. And, and I, I tell them if, if being really good was easy, everybody be great, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and once you convince kids to work hard enough that it becomes fun and they think they're doing something that somebody's not, yeah. that's when you've got them hooked. When, when they think, there's, I can't lose because I've outworked this kid. Then, then they're going to do some good things. Yeah. And that, that's definitely, that's definitely a feeling we had in our locker room all the time. We just, we, if we, we knew we could outwork them, you guys instilled that in us. You also instilled um, how to have fun. We had fun. Like there was, we were always having fun. We were always laughing. Um, but you guys would make sure that, that we were competing and trying hard first and then kind of have fun. It's kind of like the teacher, when you start school, like they don't start being the cool guy right away. They wait till you, you understand how things work. Um, but talking about hype and emotions, two things I was thinking about today that you do a great job of. Um, when we were, I thought one of the biggest traditions of our program was just how hyped we were in pregame warmups. I don't love an hour warmup. We didn't do that. Uh, but when we came out, we were, we were yelling to each other and you would always take part. You know, it's just like, yeah, eight, yeah, 22. Here we go. Two, three, have a big day those things, but your goal celebrations on the sideline. Um, I don't know if you still do them like you used to, but you used to just get going. And when we go watch it on film after um, when the team watched film, we loved it. I mean, just knowing that our coaches cared that much about us and got that excited just for us scoring a goal was pretty cool. How do you guys keep the energy going in the program? I, I think a lot of it comes from, you know, we, we talk a lot about tradition. And where do you, where are you going to stack up with these guys from 10 years ago? Where are you going to stack up with these guys from 20 years ago? You know, cause at any one of our home games, you know, there, there's 15 to 50 guys that played in that program that are there, 
you know, and, and we take a ton of pride in, in that. And honestly, you, I, I get real cranked up and I don't even know I'm doing it sometimes, um, you know, but you, you know, you go out and you work, um, you know, here in Penn Yen, lacrosse is, is a nine month a year job. Um, you know, you play football and in, in for three months and then, then you do lacrosse and you put that much time and, and, and passion and heart into it. Um, you know, especially to see a kid score a goal or something that you worked on the day before work and the kid throws it in the back of the net. Um, it, it's just really, really rewarding, you know, and I know it's kind of maybe, maybe the kids didn't know, but I knew when I got that excited, they would too. Yeah. That's it. So you knew, but I, I, <laughs> that, that, that we, we would get super excited when, when you got pumped up. Um, do you ever, do you ever sit back and look at this thing you guys created um, and just be like, wow, this is like, I mean, it was always a big thing when I was there, but it was on the kind of precipice of being, you know, people would still tell us Penny was a football town. We haven't been that great at football in a long time. So it, you know, I think in the last 20 years, I'll get random messages from people who, whose dads will be driving through the village and they'll be like, somebody was wearing Penny on lacrosse shorts and it was 20 degrees and snowing. They're like, this town is lacrosse. This village is lacrosse craze. Are you ever, are you ever like careful what you wish for? Like maybe we, maybe we, maybe we made these people too crazy about lacrosse. No. And, and honestly, when I look back, um, you know, I, I'm hoping, you know, down the road uh, when I, when I retire, that I look back and really, you know, I, I still, you know, personally, there's, I still feel a little bit of pressure to keep this going. Yeah. I bet. You, you know, um, especially, you know, I, I took over, you know, for your dad after I think the three seasons before that we'd been 60 and three. Wow. And then, um, you know, he goes to the girl's side. Um, the cupboard was pretty empty. <laughs> <laughs> quite honestly was that, the McGuffey um, years? was that when McGuffey was the lefty attackman uh I actually my first year as head coach we started six sophomores and two freshmen oh wow and we we ended up we, we made it to the state finals uh with with that young group of of kids but you know I, I still feel and it's good pressure it's not like I'm sitting home going "Ooh, <laughs> you know I gotta win um you know but there's a it, it kind of keeps keeps me young, keeps, keeps the passion in, um, that there, th this is a legacy, you know, and it means a lot to a lot of people. Um, it really does. I, I really want to continue that. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, well talking about that, sustaining a dynasty, I, I think you and Belichick, uh, gotta be the two, the two foremost people to talk to about this right now. You, you keep winning sectional championships. You keep going to state semis. You were in the state finals two years ago, right? Um, three, times, three times in the last seven. Three times the last seven years we've been in state finals in the toughest state to play lacrosse um, that there is for high school sports. And 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 how do, how do you sustain it? You talk about tradition, cultures, values. I, I think, is it talking about it every day? Is it everything? Is it the box? How do you, how do you keep it going? Uh, I, I think we start – from day one, from our preseason meeting, um, the goal of this program is to win a sectional title. And we really believe in the mindset. Um, we have 16 games in a regular season. And, and we talk to the kids. We have 16 games to get ready to win three. You know, so if we take a loss during the season, it, it's not a killer to us. Uh, it, it, it hurts, but we, we look to build off it. And we want to be ready after those. Okay, after 16 games, are we ready to, to, to compete for our number one goal? Uh, I see teams get sidetracked. Um, you know, we, we've gone, there's been a couple of years where we, we've lost a couple of games in a row, maybe lost a game we shouldn't. Um, but we've been able to learn from that uh, and realize, is that how your team's going to be remembered or are you going to be remembered down the road? You know, yeah. because – we win sectionals. Nobody's going to care that, that you lost a game on a Tuesday in the last weekend of March, <laughs> you know, yeah. nobody's going to care. You know, that I, I can tell you, I, I might remember them. Right. But the kids can't tell you, you know, if I ask a kid, what'd you do your senior year? Hey, 
You know, we won sectionals. We went to the state semis. We went to the state finals. Right. They're not going to say, you know, we lost in, you know, seven to four to somebody in April. <laughs> no, I, I, I think I learned that from, from you and my dad, because some of these coaches I've been around um, in my coaching career, I'm just like, I look at them when we lose a game, they act like the world ended. And you're like, this is obviously a teachable moment. We can, we're not supposed to win every game. And, and I think, probably a lot of it comes back to when we won the state championship in 2001. And, and we, I, I know, we, I know we beat that Jenny team if we play them again, but that loss helped us, but um, it, it's a very good point. Uh, let's change gears here a minute. I, I, I call you the offensive guru. You're also a goalie guru. Um, not a normal thing for the attack coach or the offensive coach who studies box lacrosse and goes and coaches in the NLL. And, and all of a sudden you're the goalie coach and, and, and you've had, You've had college all Americans, you've had pro goalies, and 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 uh, I tried to make a list of them, and and that was honestly our our why we weren't successful or as successful as we could be as a program is we didn't have great goalies. So you took that on, um, and now we just we just have a plethora of great goalies. So do you, does it give you a great break? Do you enjoy that? Gives you like change up. Talk to me about what, what you think about the goalie position and how you train it. I, I think we treat the goalie position a, a, a little bit different than, than other programs. Um, we don't ever just, Hey, warm up the goalie and let's shoot on them. Um, yeah. Our goalie, you know, you don't do that with an attackman. You don't do that with a midi. Everyone has specific individual drills and skills that they work on most days. Uh, and, and, you know, we started taking the goalie position, um, you know, probably around 95, 96. Um, and we started implementing more and more drills for them. And then I had five years with your brother, um, you know, so there were things that, um, you know, Brett and I kind of developed a routine, um, you know, with some tennis balls, with a shaft, with no head on it, um, four or five drills that he and I would do every day um, that kind of got him focused um, and kind of got him little pieces where he's not getting hit with the ball. He's yeah. developing skills of a goalie without getting beat up um you know and after brett had some success uh the next kid after him um you know was an eighth grader when brett was a senior rj wickham um who had a great career at navy um uh, brett kind of glorified the goalie position you know so rj wanted to be the goalie he wanted to be the next brett queener you know and then rj he's an all-american he goes to the naval academy the next kid in line I want to, I want to be like Brett Queener and RJ Wickham, you know, um, you know, and, and it's just kind of developed, um, you know, a couple of years, you know, six, seven years ago, Brandon Mashiewski in ninth grade, you know, I want to be the next Brett Queener. I want to wear 23, you know, ends up, you know, being an all American going to Stony Brook, um, you know, and, and it's a position where kids, kids want to be in the goal. Uh, and they're willing to do those little things. But I, I think we take the time to develop the goalies and we, we, I, we protect the goalies yeah. and don't let them get beat. I see young kids getting beat up um, and it, it's just, it, it gets old. Yeah, it gets I, old. I, 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 I think to your point, you also made it cool by, by giving them something different. You know, the rest of the team's doing sprints and, and, and working with my dad, which is great for us but like you know at least that that goalie's got they got you you one to one with coach Hobart for 30 minutes most most players want to hang out with coach Hobart so you know you get 30 minutes of, of your own, own time with, with you and um you know having coached these camps and stuff with Brad and trying to make more drills he shows me all the ones you do do you think it all comes not all but mostly comes back to doing a good warm-up with the shooter or is it or is it the drills and everything else that really makes it go uh, I think the drills help the goalie prepare to have a good warm up. Okay. Um, I can tell you the best, the best warm ups and the best games our goalies have. I don't score a goal on them during warm ups. Really? No. You know, because I'm putting them in a position to make saves, um, you know, and make the saves that they're going to have to make in a game. You know, um, I, I, I've seen other coaches. You know, Jesus, I saw a few years ago, two young guys were shooting on a goalie before a game and the one scored a goal and he put his hands up in the air. <laughs> you know? and, and my first thought was they're done. They're done. We're, we're, we're winning today, you know, or, you know, they're eight yards away and they're cranking it on the kid. 
hey, fantastic. You're 35 years old and you just yeah. scored eight goals, yeah. you know, and you're, and now your goalie has no confidence. Now, did it take you a while to figure that out? I, I feel like you were doing that right away. Like knowing not, it's not about you, the warm up. It's about the goalie. No, not, not right away. I mean, cause when I first started, I really loved chucking the ball. <laughs> you know, I, I love chucking the ball at, at, at the goalies and, you know, but at the time I was, I was 21 years old too. You yeah. Know? Uh, so as, as I got a little more mature, so did my, you know, warm ups of the goalies. Would you guys, or do you guys let the goalie go full field and try to score now? Um, we have had a goalie score goal, Gage Ponsetti. Gage uh, it's, fun, it's funny because everybody thinks they see Brett as he was at Herkimer and in the pros. Brett got over the midline. Your dad was calling timeout. Every time. Brett never scored a goal in high school. And he didn't go over midline much either. It wasn't, no, yeah. no, get back in the goal, you know, <laughs> but everybody thinks that we, you know, we trained this wild man running up and down the field, um, you know, and, and that kind of came later, um, you know, because he was kind of unique. He, he developed into a crazy good athlete when he was like 19 years old, yeah. 18 years old, you know, he, he wasn't very big. He wasn't very fast. He wasn't very strong. And I mean, my God, you look at him now, He's, you know, six foot plus, he's in great shape. He's ripped. You know, yeah. he, he, he developed his athleticism at a, at a later age. Well, you guys definitely helped with that though, allowing him to play in the box as an offensive player and not being like, no, you're the goalie. You have to play goalie. We, yeah. we don't make our goalies ever do that because it, it, it's two different games. And, you know, a goalie, you know, a lot of times kids don't want to put on the big pads. It, it's funny. It, I probably have four grown men that you know i can count on hey i need a goalie on you know it's a tuesday night you know um the milroy brothers are you know in their mid-30s hey you know hey i need i need a goalie at the box rink at eight o'clock eight to ten you know and these are grown men and they show up and play against the high school kids it's nice of you to say zach's in his mid-30s he's in his 40s uh um, yeah he is now in his 40s i had to throw that out there my favorite penny and goalie other than brett um i i just think i think I think Melroy was, was unbelievable, but um, a lot of that was his confidence and having to, like, he wasn't a good goalie and you guys kept working with him and, and, and made him a great goalie and, and uh, one of the cockiest players I ever played with. Let's talk some prolax. I was thinking this today. Let me throw this at you. Gary Gate, Reggie Thorpe, and Brian Hobart. That was a coaching staff. That was the three coaches for a pro lacrosse team. How cool is that? Just even hearing that. I mean, that's pretty cool. That, that, that was a great experience up in, up in Hamilton, Ontario, uh, you know, playing at McMaster university in front of 14 fans. Um, <laughs> but be, being able to, to work with Gary Gate uh, and, and Reggie was a, a great experience. The road trips up there and back, we, we, we had a blast, um, you know, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, I've been very lucky. Um, you know, I, I consider myself really lucky to, um, have been able to be around some really great guys and some great coaches. Yeah. Is, is that kind of part of why you probably, um, people have asked me why you haven't left Penyan or my dad hasn't coached college. And I, I kind of get offended. I'm like, why would they want to like, why would you, but is that part of kind of why you, you know, you, you've also coached in the NLL and, and, and for the Rattlers. So other, and, and this year for the hammerheads. So you've been on a bunch of pro staffs. Does that kind of help with that, that itch that other coaches get to try to go other places? It, it does. It does. Um, you know, and to get to work with, you know, the, I still consider myself lucky. Like, okay, look at these guys. I get to, you know, get to, get to coach, um, you know, look at these players that I have on offense, you know um, you know, I feel like I'm getting the army men out, you know, playing X's and O's again uh, with, with the skill level that they have. Um, so that, that part is really enjoyable. Uh, and I love the compete level, you know, as you know, guys that play pro lacrosse aren't getting rich. The compete level on these guys is through the roof. They do it because they love it and they want to compete. To, want to, to watch them yeah. compete, um, is, is just really cool. And, and they're also happy to be there. Um, and, and that's not always the case in college lacrosse. And, and it's not always the case in, in, in some other high schools, I assume, but they just don't always want to be there and there's some complaining and things like that. And so you get to that level. Okay. You bring out the army men. That makes me laugh. <laughs> I'm proud of that. I usually think of the football guys, the, the yellow, you know, the yellow and those guys. We, 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 we use the football guys more than the army men. So back 
to our listeners back before there was a lot of like whiteboards you could take places and things and chalkboards were harder to get your hands on coach Hobart my dad used to sit at the table and they'd take those little GI Joe army men um, the little plastic green ones and they'd set up like the offense and the defense and they'd walk through it and they'd let the me taker was the goal <laughs> yeah I've seen that and, and they'd let me and Brett watch and people are always like how did you guys get so smart about lacrosse? And you're like, that's what we're watching on a random Tuesday night. I remember having you guys always come back from convention. Like you've, you've solved the, the world's problems. Like everything is, is, is good. Like we know what we're running this year. We're going to kill every team. And, and, and those were always fun. So this year I'll take it back to the, to the MLL though. You're with the hammerheads. Would you guys want it? If you would have stuck around for the finals? Uh, I, I think we would have had a chance. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, all, all four of the teams that made that qualified for the playoffs are really talented. Uh, we were hot. We had a young group of kids with really with, that still had fresh legs. Um, and you know, when you've got a group that believes you can pull something off, um, you know, this, unfortunately, you know, the circumstances, um, didn't give us that opportunity, you know, um, you know, Denver didn't end up winning it, but I, how incredibly talented was that team? Yeah. Um, I think Boston, um, got the extra day off when, when us in Chesapeake left and they were able to move personnel around. Um, and I think if, if, if Denver and Boston play on Saturday, Denver beats them by 10 goals. Yeah. But Boston, I, I, their coaching staff did a great job of moving some guys around, um, when they had some players you know, choose to leave Annapolis at that point. Yeah. Um, they really kind of fit the pieces together really well. Um, about the middle of the second quarter, I was thinking, wow, th these guys did a nice job um, of really getting themselves organized in a day. Yeah, they did. And, and, and that Upgren guy, that's one of the things I really like about pro lacrosse is a guy like that who played D3, who's probably hurt for years that he didn't play D1 and he got his chance to finally get the ball more in his stick and I think he went for five. Um, John Upgren has been killing it for years. Really? Uh, you Is know, I, I still, I, I've been around the NLL for a long time. John Upgren's a guy that deserves a chance to play in the NLL. Yeah. Well, you know, I wanted to ask you that. So you played, you played senior B. I don't know if you saw my tweet the other day. I think I actually tweeted after talking to you. Um, but you played senior B for a while. And I think you tried out for the Syracuse smash. A couple times. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's really hard as an American to break through the league. I've been telling Bradley for, for years or Bubba, I'm like, you got to be prepared to get cut for about five years. Uh, have, you have got to be willing to go to Canada uh, or to the first nations reservation uh, to kind of cut your teeth. Yeah. The first year I got cut in Syracuse, uh, Freeman Bucktooth um, said, you know, you, you need, you need more box experience. So I, I spent the next five summers, um, you know, playing, playing on the Onondaga reservation. You played five years? Five years at Onondaga, yeah. Wow. Mixed in the, with a little up in Ganawagi, a little in Aquasasne. Um, you know, I, I was fortunate at the time um, where my, you know, my job allowed me to, you know, on, on a Friday afternoon, load up the pickup truck and, and, and go for, for the weekend. That's awesome. Who was, the, who was the best player you played against in the senior B? It was probably a guy that I played with. Red. Uh, Eddie Shenandoah. Okay. Uh, he actually made the Syracuse smash uh, okay. and scored four or five goals in an exhibition game. Uh, and then he hurt his knee badly. Uh, um, but Eddie was, he, he played, uh, I think he went to Herkimer uh, at one point, but uh, he runs the arena now at, at Onondaga. And what a, what a fantastic, fantastic player and a, and a real gentleman. Lefty or righty? Righty. Big okay. barrel chested guy could shoot the ball so hard i i wish i could go back and watch you uh, in those games were you setting a lot of picks were you what was your game like uh i had pretty good hands but i was a banger yeah <laughs> i was a banger i took some face-offs uh I, I wasn't a guy that was on you the power face-offs yeah 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 it yeah. Was, wasn't a guy that i you know i wasn't getting any power play time um but i i could play out of both doors you know so how, how do you, so what I tweeted the other day was, all right, you know, let's say the borders are closed and we can't get any of the Canadians down here, even though I know for sake of argument, they played in the PLL, but let's just say we can't. 
does that uh, do you see any scenario where there's a replacement player season with Americans? Do you I'll no. Just start with that. no, no, I, I, I think that the NLL will uh, wait till you know, hopefully things clear up. Um, I know the commissioner said something today about possibly even March or April. Yeah. Um, waiting until then to get it, get things going. Um, you know, I, I know from what I've you know heard from folks associated with the league uh, that they want to play a full season. Um, and right now that's really not, I mean, that, that would be completely impossible right now, but I think, uh, you know, they're hoping that things clear up a little bit, um, you know, down the road so that that can happen. Um, I would love to see more American players in the game. Sure. Um, but as you said, I mean, you tried tried to make it with the Toronto Rock, and you had to you had to play in Canada. You have to make, um, you know, Joey Restateris is a perfect example. Joey's an American uh, from Buffalo that spent you know his childhood summers playing box lacrosse in in St. Catharines, Ontario, um, as as his brother Frank, who was a great NLL player as, as well. Um, you know, until more kids are willing to do that it's it's going to be hard um a, a great example this year is uh charlie kitchen from delaware he had a couple teammates that played for the toronto beaches uh he went up last summer and played 12 or 13 games with the toronto beaches uh and was the 24th pick in the draft this year yeah so it, it, if, if americans are listening at home and they want to play you, your best advice to them is try to try to get to canada and play i don't even think we have enough enough leagues here to even try um, you know, I, I think some of the U.S. box leagues, um, you know, are, are really doing some good stuff. Um, but if you look, I mean, those, those guys that are playing box are playing in a house league when they're five years old. Yeah. And a five-year-old in, New York, in, in, this, in the United States goes to a, you know, little kid field lacrosse practice and touches the ball three times, drops it, drops it three times can't pick up a ground ball where a kid playing in the house league, a five-year-old up in Ontario is the ball's not going anywhere. It's coming back to you. You know, if you miss it, you chase it, you know, they're, they're getting, you know, and, and it's evident by their skill level. Right. I mean, it's why I'd rather play three by or speed lacrosse or goalie wars or whatever you want to call it. The game we used to play in the gym with the pinky ball and you got to move it every three seconds with a box goalie. Um, I'd rather play any of those games and do a passing or shooting drill at this point in my career. But you know, you still got to do them as coaches, I guess. We're, we're, we're actually trying to change that as much as we can. I'll, I'll ask you this. You, you've coached the, the greatest state of high school across. You've coached in the MLL, the NLL, Team USA, um, played senior B. What's your favorite version of the game? And do we have it yet? Right? Like, is there another version we haven't even, like the new Olympic one? Is that, I don't think it's going to be better, but do you think we've reached the, the best version yet? Or do you, and what's yours? If, if, you know, I, I'm an old guy now, but if I could go back and play, I, you know, if I had to pick one, you know, kind of style, I'd go back, I'd play box. Yeah. Not, not even, you know, not even close. Uh, you know, I, I, I have developed a real love uh, and passion for the box game. Um, you know, cause it, it it's physical. Um, it, it's gritty but it's a beautiful game. Yeah, it, it really is. If people take the time uh, to, to look at the skill level of some of these guys, you know, um, I, I can remember, you know, when, when John Grant Jr. first came to the Rochester Nighthawks, um, I couldn't wait to go because every time he played, he did something that I'd never seen before. Right. You know, when, when he was young, you know, he, he was going to, you know, and I kept thinking to myself, well, I've never seen anybody do that. And yeah. then the next week he'd do something else that I, I'd never seen anybody do before, you know? And, and I think the creativity mixed with the toughness, I, I really like. Yeah. I, I love playing it. Um, my only things I say bad about the game are the goalies. It, it's just a bit ridiculous. Like some nights you're just like, why, why can't we score? But I, it's playing it. It's just so fun. Um, it is so fast and, and, and you can, and you can hit a lot. I do like that part. You do get to just really run into guys as long as you do it the right way. Um, and, and I'd also like to echo what, what Bradley said is you give me a game of speed lacrosse or goalie wars. 
Uh, you know, I, I'm 51 years old and I'll play goalie wars all day long. We, you beat me at camp two summers ago because we didn't have it last summer, but yeah, you got in there, beat me. It, it's such a fun game, you know, and just where there's no pressure, you're just having fun. Um, you know, I mean, out, out in your backyard, you and your brother were, you know, 10 and 12 years old. And I was, you know, in my mid twenties and I'd be out there for hours with you, <laughs> you know? And then, you know, when Bradley was a little kid, you know, I I'm playing against him, you know? So, so I don't think we've come up with the best version of the game. I'm going to drop that today out right now. Um, I think long poles have gotten absolutely absurd. Like what they used to have to do to throw a check, you could get by them. And now they can throw 17 checks and they're not getting by or, and beat you with those light sticks they got. Um, I just think there's a hybrid field box game that we haven't discovered yet. Like I want moving picks in the field game. I think just let it happen. Like let them cross check them in the lower back. Like it could open up a lot of things, but that's kind of my, maybe go down to three poles instead of four. I, I think they need to change the sticks. I do too. What do you want? What do you want? I think that some of the issue is with, with the stick technology I mean, basically you have to shoot the ball, shoot it with a bazooka to get the ball out of it. Yeah. Uh, and that leads to all the slashing and whacking. Um, you know, you, you watch highlight tapes of, you know, a, a Dave Petromala or a Brian Volker or a Pat McCabe, um, you know, the, the checks that they threw uh, to dislodge the ball. I mean, they were things of beauty. Yeah. Uh, and now it wouldn't, the ball wouldn't even begin to move in the stick. No, I, I couldn't agree more. If we could have a poke check, get the ball this lodge, it would make the game so much more fun. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't agree more. Okay, big guitar guy, Coach Over. I've seen you do some air guitars, uh, a lot of them. Uh, if you had to pick, and the Owen brothers are alive, Dwayne and Greg, are you going to a Pearl Jam show or an Owen Brothers show? You're wearing a Pearl Jam shirt, so maybe. Ah. <laughs> uh. It's funny because I, I love Dwayne Allman, uh, but my favorite guitarist with the Allman Brothers is actually Warren Haynes, um, yeah. who also has his own band, Government Mule. Um, but if you threw Warren and Dwayne together, I'd go to the Allman Brothers. Okay. Uh, but if not, I'm I'm going to a Pearl Jam show. Me and you went to a great Pearl Jam show in uh, in Memphis. That was real fun. Memphis. I, I my favorite memory of that is uh, one of my favorite Pearl Jam songs is of the girl. Uh, and that was the opener that night. It was, it was just really fun. I mean, it was just one of those groups that you, as you're watching them, you're still even more excited than, than you were even before the show. And, and, and it was amazing. So I mentioned earlier, we started every game with combo. You don't run combo anymore. It is a harder play to, to, to run. Do you have a win the game play in, in your, in your repertoire right now? Or do you kind of feel it? I know some, some teams I've heard this a lot the last couple of years, you got to have one play, you know, you can score on to me. I don't know what to do with that because I'm like, if I have one play, I know what to score on. I'm calling that play all game, but, and I don't think that play exists. Do you have the play always in your mind or are you going to feel by game? And like, this has been working in the game or do you change it? Um, I would probably go out of a 13 set. Uh, <laughs> and I, and I start counting from up top, uh, you know, so one midi up top, uh, two midis on the wings, one on the crease and two behind. Uh, and get into a wing dodge either by himself or a two-man game. Uh, and really with that, I put my best shooter uh, at that top midfield spot and I'd really have him crowd the Dodger uh, yeah. and kind of bait the slide. And, and when the slide goes, almost drift out the backside for a step down, um, you know, looking to draw an upfield slide, uh, you know, and kind of get that three on two on the backside. Okay. Yeah. You know, because you've got the option of, your midi dodger beats him clean. He can shoot. You draw the double, you hit your best shooter on the drift. Uh, and then you've got the defense rotating. Um, and that's part of the reason I like the open set. Um, I like my kids to see the slide coming in their face. So if I can set a defense up where my kid knows, okay, they're going to come off this guy right into my face. I'm going to see him coming. Yeah. Then we can get, then good things are happening. Yeah. Do you still, how many man up plays you got? Um, three or four staples, and then we'll throw in something a little, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I, I, I really believe that the best coaches are really good thieves. Yeah. 
Um, you know, so I, I have my core group of man ups that I like. Um, my philosophy has changed. I used to run a lot of set plays. Um, now we run maybe a set play, but there's a formational change in it. Um, you know, and we kind of, if, if we start in a three, three, we're going to end up in a one, four, if we start in a one, four, um, you know, we might go to a two, three and end with three, three. Yeah. Um, so it's more formationally. Now it's not as many set plays. Are you still adding as you go? Like the, I, I, I'm thinking here as I'm listening to you talk, I'm pretty sure like our last practice before we, before I played a game for you senior year, we'd still put in a new man up wrinkle, you know? Yeah. 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 Add the wrinkles. Well, and I really, the thing that I've really found the last couple of years and a lot of it's uh, to do with indoor is we've started doing a lot more picking in the extra man game. Oh, interesting. I'm, on the ball is everywhere. There's some sets where if you set a screen and carry over it. Well, they love doing that. I know exactly what you're talking about in indoor. Yep. You know, um, yeah. You know, we're running drags and, and seals, um, you know, out of, out of a three, three look uh, that a lot of team, not many high school teams are doing that. Just kind of like, um, what are you doing? Yeah. They're like, I'm not used to getting picked in my five man rotation. Yeah. And, and then, mm. and then we're stealing goals. Cause they're you like, know, now you we talking about stealing goals. We were talking earlier about the end line plays. Are you calling the end line plays still? Or are you letting guys call it on the field ever? Uh, I'm still calling it. Or, you know, there's times where in the pregame, okay, you know, the, fir the first time off the end line, we're going to, uh, you know, a hammer look. Yeah. Or we're going to run a hawk look the first time off the end line. Um, you know, and after that, I'll kind of dictate. I can hear you yelling hammer right now. <laughs> In my head, yeah. Hammer it. Um, last question. Do you hate Canandaigua? Or as you get older, do you appreciate how great the rivalry is? You don't have to answer it because you are still coaching. Well, I mean, you kind of have to answer it, but yeah, what you know what I'm getting at. Are you kind of at the point now where you're just like, this is I'm at the point, and I can't believe I'm at this point where I'm like, this is pretty cool, our rivalry. I I really respect the rivalry. Uh, I, I think it in, in upstate New York, the Pena and Canandaigua game, especially when it turned into one time a year. Yeah. Um, it, it's just, it, it's really special. And it's, it's crazy that it's 42, 42. I don't like that. If, I, I don't like that either. <laughs> I'm the coach. I don't like that either. Um, but they're not my favorite program. How about that? It. I love it. I love it. I think that's you good. Know? <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're not my favorite program. I appreciate that. that that's, um, you know, I, the only thing I'll add to that, and because I, I do, I, they've got a good young coach. He, do, he does a nice job, um, you know, but I do like to stir the pot a little. Um, yeah. You know, they, they refer to themselves as the chosen, split, chosen spot. Yep. Um, as I tell our kids before we exit the locker room, none of your parents chose to live there. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask you to give me some pregame speech stuff. Cause you guys, you guys always seem to have some beauties, but that that's pretty good. None of your parents chose to live there. I love that. Well, coach, I appreciate having you on. I can't wait to get back to, to Penyan soon. And I really appreciate all the gear you sent me. Um, I will send you some Denver. You got your. I thought you'd pull it out today. I didn't know if you had one or not. I guess you should, but mine's mine's back out uh, in storage. Yeah, I got a kick. I got a kick out of that with uh, with you and Bradley last week. Yeah, he had it right ready. He's like, "You got one." I'm like, "Oh yeah, I got one too." Um, it, it, it's it's that has become a little thing on its own too, uh, which is really cool. You know, um, Connor Finger, who's at Albany now, was an All American. Um, I, the look on his face the day that I said, you think you're up for wearing number eight, you know, he's in eighth grade, Yeah. you know, and yeah, coach, I want it. He said that. Yeah. And he, and he did it really proud. Yeah, he did. He did. I mean, I was, I was excited for, to watch him play regardless ever since I met the kid when he's in like second grade. Um, is he eight at Albany? Uh, 23. Oh, that's right. I did see that. That's 23. Pretty cool. Who do we have an eight now? Who's the eight after? Or, uh, he, Connor graduated uh, two years ago. This past season, there was not going to be a number. We're going to go no eight. Uh, this spring, I do not think there will be a number eight. I know who the next one is. 
Yeah. Um, Does he know? Hmm? Does he know? Have you told this person? Uh, I kind of flirted around the subject. He's a little kid. Yeah. How old is he? I can't tell you that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll text you'll, you'll, you'll see when he busts out the eight. I'll text you about it later. Oh, well, that's awesome, Coach. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to be on the show. And, and maybe this spring, when you guys get rolling again, we can get you on an update show. I'd love that, man. Thanks for having me. I miss you, kid. Love you. Thanks, Coach. Love you, too. I got to hit stop record. And then, okay. Oh, no, I just stopped my video. I usually hang up on everybody. I don't, I don't hang out with them.